And Johnson, as it says in the quote on the left, was a was known as a friend of labor. And at the bottom of the of the quote, that he supported and pushed through at least modest minimum wage laws in California. And today, it's common uh, for people to believe, at least on the left, liberals, progressives, leftists, that a minimum wage is just the right thing to do if you care about people and workers and the average you know, person in society. If you don't support it, you're greedy uh, and you, know, you, know, you don't care about anybody but yourself. You don't, certainly don't care about the average person. You're a rich person who just doesn't uh, give a damn about anybody else. And that's probably true in, in, in plenty of cases. And I'm not saying you can't make a good argument for the benefits of a minimum wage, but there is another side to it, uh, as there usually is uh, in these kind of things. Uh, and the other side uh, was talked about at the time. So, uh, quoting Professor Leonard again, who we already know has a more critical uh, view of the progressive movement overall, illiberal reformers, the title of the book gives it away itself, but he says the economists, meaning of the time, agreed a binding minimum wage, not just in California, but anywhere, would raise the income of some, but only by also throwing the least skilled workers out of work. So let's stop there. How did, what, do you, what do they mean? Well, at least this is how the thinking goes. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I don't, I don't know. I'm not an economist myself. But the idea is that if employers are allowed to pay workers whatever they see fit, that, a, a, say, a, the lowest skilled workers they have, some of them might not be great workers. Uh, the, the, I mean, this guy's not that doesn't do that good of a job, but I'm not paying him very much money, so you know I'm not going to think about it too much. It's not that big of a deal. But if the state, meaning a state government or the federal government, steps in and mandates that you pay everybody a minimum, which then raises the wage of that guy that's not that good at his job, now he's going to be scrutinized more by the business, by the owner, by the company. And they're, they, they're likely to say, or at least might say, you know what, since we have to pay this person that holds this position more now, uh, right, to, we should get somebody better if we're going to fork out more money for it. So this is the uh, the argument that's still made even to this day uh, that at, at its most extreme says that minimum wages, though you know usually having good intentions behind them, uh, don't achieve the desired effect. In fact, in fact, they are harmful uh, to at least some workers, usually the most vulnerable, uh, uh, not helpful. The quote goes on, reformers saw the potential or saw the removal of the less productive not as a cost of the minimum wage, but as positive benefit to society. Removing the inferior from work was not a regrettable outcome. It benefited society by protecting American wages and Anglo Saxon racial integrity. If you look at some of the biggest name economists and uh, social scientists of the period, many of them at the University of Wisconsin, La Follette State uh, and other uh, major universities, Brown, Johns Hopkins, some Ivy League schools, other Ivy League schools as well, you'll see that many of the so-called progressive economists believe that the minimum wage was a way to root out what they saw as the less fit workers uh, uh, in pure racist thinking uh, so that uh, the more superior, in their view, Anglo-Saxon, which means sort of white, uh, uh, you know, people of European descent, uh, would take the jobs and do and do a better job. And, and this is again based on racist thinking. So, so the, the the point here is that Hiram Johnson's commitment to progressive reforms, and you look at the list of things that he supported and pushed through. I just picked out the minimum wage as one example, but in all of these, you can argue that yes, they're beneficial and they're they're necessary for a good society to improve society. But there's always a counter argument that we made that sometimes does get left out. Jane Adams and the Settlement House Movement. Jane Adams, to me, is the archetypal progressive. If you had to have a def definition of progressive reformer. Uh, you know, as sort of the classic example, uh, I would pick Jane Addams, a remarkable woman with a remarkable career uh, and a huge impact on American society. And 
I would also say that this is one of the features of the progressive era that shows uh, progressivism at its best, though there are things that can be criticized here. Adams herself came from an upper-middle-class background, uh, college-educated uh, woman who, in young adulthood, took a trip to England and was shocked by the terrible working conditions and living conditions of the poor on the east side or east end of London when she visited there. As part of her visit, uh, she went to a place called Toynbee Hall uh, in London, which really was the first settlement house, uh, and uh, Jane Adams got the idea then from her visit to England. Uh, and so uh, it wasn't entirely innovative on her part, uh, since she uh, mimicked it and uh, created a, 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 a version of it uh, back in the United States when she came home. But she basically created uh, the career and discipline uh, of social work. Now you can get degrees in social work, but she basically invented the whole field. And you could say she was the first social worker, but uh, then hired uh, the first sort of set group of social workers in the progressive era. So what were settlement houses? Uh, they provided uh, living spaces, apartment buildings. The, they would buy uh, a, a building. This is on the left, a picture of Hull House in Chicago, the first settlement house that she was the driving force behind. But some wealthy benefactor, uh, Adams became uh, quite good at raising uh, uh, money uh, to make her projects work. Uh, and but somebody or a group of investors would uh, put up the money to buy a building or more in a neighborhood, fix it up, renovate it, uh, and then provide uh, uh, you know better, uh, more healthy, uh, safer living spaces, primarily for immigrants. Uh, who were uh, poor and without this kind of help were often living in run-down, dirty tenement buildings, uh, you know, not uh, not uh, kept up at all by the landlords, uh, with you know little sewage and no running water, terrible conditions overall. So this was designed to, designed to improve the lives of primarily uh, poor immigrants. But they also uh, provided all kinds of social services, and the social work part of it comes in to help them assimilate uh, in American society uh, and to succeed uh, in that society. So the social workers that she hired, Jane Adams that is, uh, and Adams herself provided daycare services, language classes, uh, sports, swimming, swimming pools, and uh, all kinds of activities uh, to keep people uh, you know, engaged and happy uh, and so they could uh, you know, flourish. Uh, the idea, which gets back to one of our core values and beliefs of the progressives, is that uh, improving the environment, uh, right, uh, will help sort of improve the, the individual. Uh, the environment shapes the individual. So in this case, literally cleaning up the environment, scrubbing the floors and, you know, cleaning, uh, getting rid of the dirt and the grime, uh, making the uh, the living space uh, more habitable, making people happier and in a better mood, the thinking goes, uh, will uh, help them to succeed because they'll be more optimistic, they'll be more productive, they'll whistle a happy tune uh, when they go out looking for a job, uh, knowing that their their life is uh, decent and that they have, a, they have a chance because they're being supported with all these services uh, like language classes, like daycare, both of which, as you can see, uh, would help somebody, an immigrant, uh, to uh, get a job. Uh, Adams was extremely exacting in what she expected of her social workers, who were uh, almost all women, maybe they all were, I forget, and among other things, she expected them to live on the premises. So her social workers lived there, which many of them probably didn't like. But if they wanted that career, if they wanted that job, they had no choice. Why wouldn't they like it? Because most of these women were from middle class or upper middle class backgrounds, elite backgrounds in some cases, college educated, and they're now living uh, right uh, in the poor slum areas, and many of them probably weren't wild about it. But Adams, I think, understood, uh, uh, was keenly aware uh, that the, the social workers would probably do a better job 
if they saw the lives and activities of the people that they worked with on a daily basis 24-7. If they're there all the time, there's going to be uh, greater knowledge uh, picked up, maybe greater empathy uh, uh, for what these people go through because you're not just there 9 to 5, you're there uh, you know, most of the time. So uh, uh, this is one of the ways in which uh, Jane Addams uh, expected a great deal uh, out, of, out of those. But what a tremendous uh, uh, idea. T to me, there's hardly, there isn't much of a downside to this. This is the progressive uh, movement at its best. Uh, Adams famously said, civilization is a method of living, an attitude of equal respect for, for all. Uh, so the, the one downside that I, I uh, will focus on here, there are a few other minor things too, but the leaders here, uh, the progressive thinkers, progressive activists like Adams and others, they tended to assume that their middle class values, usually kind of white middle class values, getting us back to our prototype model of, you know, a uh, stereotypical progressive, were the proper ones, uh, were the right ones. And so immigrants from other countries, people of different ethnic and racial backgrounds with different cultures, different you know cultural features, tended to be, in a sense, uh, trained and socialized away from their old ways, uh, you know, from their, their uh, old country uh, of doing things. Name of thing. So the, the, the idea being that there's a certain amount of elitism and a certain amount of uh, superiority or belief of superiority in white sort of Anglo-Saxon middle-class values, American middle-class values, and that if people want to succeed, they have to copy and emulate uh, and you know, sort of be like middle-class white people. So that's a legitimate criticism. Though, of course, it can also be argued that that value system showed itself to work uh, and that Adams and others like her, not just settlement house leaders, but other progressives held the same kind of views, that that they might have been right. It's, it is possible that they were right, that such uh, values uh, worked for them. Why shouldn't they work uh, for somebody else, since this is American society? Uh, so all, all these things, again, cut in many different directions. Lastly, Adams, of course, wasn't the only person that started a settle, settlement house. This idea took off, uh, and many others, some of them became famous, like Lillian Wald, uh, established settlement houses, because this was in Chicago, but uh, they spread to the cities of uh, the country, New York City, and other uh, places. So uh, Adams started a craze and started a new type of institution. I, sh I shouldn't have said lastly, because I have a second lastly. <laughs> Sorry, I do that a lot. Uh, but there's something else I find striking about this as well, uh, which in some ways counters uh, one of the major values uh, of the uh, progressive era, which is that government has a, a bigger and stronger, uh, Im more important role to play than ever before in improving American life. This wasn't a government program. This was done through the private sector. Uh, so this was done through the initiative of you know private investors and uh, outside of government. And I only mention that because we have a tendency, I think even today, partly the long-run influence of progressive thinking going all the way back to this time period to assume that for society to be improved, social uh, groups of uh, uh, Americans, working class, uh, middle class, to, for their lives to be improved, it has to be the government that puts through laws and programs to do so. And I think that's true in some cases. I, I'm, I don't think the idea is wrong, but I, I like this example uh, of what the private sector uh, can also do uh, that pushes also in the direction of uh, improvement and reform, the betterment of American life uh, and uh, uh, you know, American lives. Which brings us to Upton Sinclair. How many of you have read The Jungle? Not his only novel, but far and away his uh, most famous novel, uh, and uh, extremely influential uh, book at the time, uh, published in 1906. 
the same year as the Meat Inspection Act uh, and his book, which in part uh, was a fictional uh, uh, expose of the meatpacking industry, which whose heart was in Chicago, uh, as we've already learned. So uh, Sinclair uh, actually said, after the fact, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. Which is a great quote because it rather, in rather pithy fashion, it says that he was writing a book actually about the evils of capitalism, as he saw it, and promoting socialism. So the book is about fictional Lithuanian immigrants who come to Chicago and have really no choice but to work in the meatpacking industry. It's the only jobs they can find. And they're chasing what's now called the American dream by coming to America, only to find that things don't improve for them. They stay in poverty, and actually their lives get worse and worse and worse. So what Sinclair was doing uh, through fiction was trying to show Americans that capitalism was a failure, a moral and practical failure, and that socialism was the wave of the future and a more humane system. But in he did some research or some study of the conditions of the meatpacking industry. He certainly embellished it uh, in the novel, uh, but some of it was uh, relatively accurate about the horrible conditions, uh, unsanitary, unhealthy conditions. This is production of meat. You don't want unsanitary conditions uh, in uh, you know the uh, packaging uh, of meat. I mean, you don't want them in anything, but that is particularly uh, uh, revolting. But he did such a good job, apparently, that when the public read this book, they focused more on the meatpacking part of it than they did, and sometimes t entirely miss the fact that Sinclair was mainly making a, a, a you know a spirited critique of capitalism uh, and uh, a, a promotion of, of, of socialism. Many of them didn't even see that. So I aimed at the public's heart, meaning I was trying to sort of get them to emotionally uh, right to uh, respond uh, to the evils of capitalism as a whole. But in sort of doing that, I had to tell a story uh, about you know people in uh, real life, or at least you know mimicking real life here because the meatpacking industry and its conditions were real, uh, but people got so wrapped up in the characters and their involvement in the meatpacking industry that that's all they focused on and didn't seem to see the bigger lesson, the bigger issue that uh, Sinclair was promoting. But his book uh, influenced the uh, country directly, uh, as Wolford McClay says, by the fierce public outcry stirred up by uh, uh, Sinclair's disturbing expose uh, or of the meatpacking industry. And this actually did have some impact in bringing about the Meat Inspection Act uh, of the same year. It's certainly not the only factor, but but it's one of them. Meaning this was the first, in, in that same year, during the Roosevelt administration, the government passed legislation uh, for the first time that required national, federal inspection of meat. Uh, and it had at least in part to do with uh, Americans freaking out and panicking uh, after reading uh, Sinclair's book and now being afraid uh, of the meat that they were buying uh, or had been buying at the store. Which brings us to John Dewey, uh, right? Uh, so we talked about politicians, social workers, writers, fiction, uh, and otherwise. And now we get to a an academic, a uh, philosophy professor at Harvard named John Dewey, uh, one of the major figures of the uh, progressive movement. Uh, Dewey's, though a philosophy professor at Harvard, uh, he's mainly known for his uh, uh, impact on education. Uh, Deweyite schools uh, started to spread across the country after his original experimental school at the University of Chicago. Uh, was shown to be a success, or at least many thought of it as a success. Dewey advocated an education for children, and he had lesson plans uh, of a, how a progressive education was to work at each grade level, but he believed that students learned 
more uh, and learned more effectively, it's things sunk in and are more interesting if they weren't just reading lessons out of books and doing rote memorization of things, but they were actually learning by doing. That they were actively involved in their education, and so he drew up uh, sort of a curriculum uh, accordingly. He wasn't saying that books uh, shouldn't be used. He's saying that books should be supplemented or should be you know, on par with sort of a more active approach to education. For instance, and I'm just off the top of my head remembering uh, some of his curriculum, but I forget what grade it was, but in one of his lesson plans, he had the students cook lunch uh, for each other. Uh, and uh, uh, so he taught them how to, and it had to be um, sort of safety provisions and things, but they cooked lunch, and within cooking lunch, collectively, together as a class, they also, there were science and kind of math lessons sort of built into it as they went along, because there's temperatures of, uh, you know, the oven or stove or whatever it was that they were doing. So it was a practical, hands-on way to learn uh, about uh, uh, certain subjects. Also, uh, and this shows it to be progressive through and through, Dewey was trying to socialize students to become citizens in American society in a democracy uh, and showing them that, hey, if you want to be a, a good citizen, you need to learn to work together. You need to work together sort of uh, collectively, which also gets us back to one of the values of the progressive movement, and that is the belief that uh, American life should be less about individualism, uh, about individual uh, liberty, and more about collective concerns, that people are equal and people, the, the whole society uh, takes care of uh, itself uh, and the thinking, the, the unit of analysis should be the collective uh, more than it should be the individual. So, but picking out uh, uh, the other side uh, as well, which is my uh, you know, consistent uh, way to do this from slide to slide. Also quoting our guy who was pouring cold water on the whole progressive era in illiberal reformers, uh, Leonard says Dewey loved that he'd gone to school in Germany, university education in Germany. Dewey loved that Germany subordinated its legislature to the bureaucracy, which conducted the real business of government, which was administration. Uh, so uh, back to Woodrow Wilson's idea, uh, and this shows that it wasn't just Woodrow Wilson, this was spread pretty uh, widely through progressive ranks, uh, but that uh, he, he loved the idea that in Germany, their government didn't have so much power in the elected, elected legislature, uh, but had a lot of power to the administration, bureaucracy, unelected, appointed bureaucrats, technocrats, economists, etc., uh, who uh, conducted the real business of government. So this uh, was uh, certainly uh, a progressive uh, idea that was pushed pretty heavily. Leonard also says that Dewey advocated some form of race-based immigration restriction, which we won't get into too much. And I'm not trying to trash John Dewey here. Again, I think uh, the Deweyite schools uh, were known for their uh, excellence. Uh, a, a number of famous... Uh, gifted, brilliant uh, people uh, came out of these schools, uh, you know, had uh, uh, famous uh, and uh, very successful careers. So there's something to uh, uh, what he was putting forward, but just to show, you know, that there are some, uh, there are some criticisms that are valid here. He did have some views about immigration uh, that unfortunately kind of fit the uh, progressive mold. Uh, remember their, their weak spot as white, professional, middle class, mostly males, uh, is race uh, and uh, immigration. Uh, fear of, uh, you know, the Anglo-Saxon racial stock being watered down. Dewey's not alone by any means, but for someone uh, that is so, again, quote-unquote progressive, uh, at least to our ears, this doesn't sound so progressive today. Richard T. Uh, uh, Ellie, uh, 
a social scientist. So now we move to another academic, uh, this time a econ professor at the University of Wisconsin, where the Wisconsin idea was being experimented with. Again, kind of the administrative state uh, in the laboratory. Uh, he wrote a book uh, during the Gilded Age called Introduction to Political Economy. Uh, and he and other uh, economists of the progressive uh, bent argued that industrial capitalism uh, required continuous supervision, investigation, and regulation uh, in uh, McGarris book he says social solidarity means that our true welfare uh, is not an individual matter purely but likewise oh I'm sorry this is now quoting this is McGarris I'm sorry quoting uh, 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 Ellie uh, saying that social solidarity means that our true welfare is not an individual matter purely but likewise a social affair our wheel is common wheel. We thrive only in a common wealth. Our exaltation is the exaltation of our fellows. Their elevation is our enlargement. Uh, another, yet again, fancy way of saying that this is about sort of what's best for the group. Uh, social solidarity, not about what's best for the individual, not about individual freedom. And that sounds well and good. And there's a positive side to it, but on the downside, it does, it can, and usually does, sort of run up against and conflict with individual freedoms. The individual's right to sort of do what they want, live their life as they want, come and go as they please, believe what they want, uh, you know, uh, engage in the activities they want, provided they're not harming other people. He uh, says uh, in a number of sort of uh, disparate passages here, the blurbs of quotes I've picked out. Nature gives us man, whereas society gives us the ideal man. So this is uh, showing us that Ellie believed in the idea of the uh, malleability of uh, human beings, that you can uh, change them. So nature gives us genes, but that just gives us people. Uh, but society gives us ideal people uh, if we use society and our knowledge as social scientists, maybe, uh, uh, to reshape and reform uh, human beings. So it's uh, it's the educated experts uh, in social science and other fields uh, that can improve on mankind. Uh, the you know just the bland, average man that nature gives us isn't good enough. He goes on in another. Uh, writing, a uh, piece of writing to say, the word is no longer natural selection, but social selection. So Darwin's uh, uh, phrase, natural selection, meaning nature selects. No, no, no. Nature selects, again, that's genes. Uh, those aren't good enough. Uh, we can add uh, our social knowledge uh, right, to what we've learned and uh, how we can then reshape, reform uh, human life to make it better. And uh, as is becoming kind of a theme, you can see now so many uh, of these progressive thinkers, as their major blind spot, show themselves to be racists uh, and uh, uh, xenophobes. Uh, he said, blacks are for the most part grown-up children and should be treated as such. He also said the state, and I, 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 that previous statement doesn't really require any more comment, other than to say uh, it's just flat-out racism uh, and uh, you know, appalling to us today. But unfortunately, for those that you know look back at the progressive era favorably, uh, this is is a very uh, right incriminating uh, uh, mark uh, on you know the progressive movement. The state is a moral person. Uh, again. He is uh, uh, turning the government sort of into the savior. Uh, it, it's the state's job to sort of behave in a moral fashion. Uh, not that government and government leaders can't behave uh, in a moral fashion, shouldn't, uh, but to say that the state is a moral person uh, is giving it a, a lot of, I think, responsibility uh, and placing expectations that might be misplaced when there are other places in society we often uh, 
and could and maybe even should go uh, to find morality uh, if we have to rely on the state uh, to do so um, you could argue that that's not necessarily uh, the best thing two more academics on our list social scientists as well uh, on the uh, left on the top uh, the sociologist botanists and paleontologists at Brown University uh, wrote a book called Dynamic so uh, Sociology, his early uh, uh, career uh, in the Gilded Age. And on the right, Edward A. Ross, an economist and sociologist at the University of Wisconsin, another one of these guys, uh, right, uh, doing the kind of Wisconsin idea experiment. Uh, he was a student uh, of the previously mentioned Richard uh, uh, Ellie. Uh, so uh, there's a connection between some of these guys. The uh, Ward, on the left, uh, was uh, in some ways the intellectual spearhead of the progressive assault on laissez-faire. Uh, laissez-faire, again, hands-off, meaning the, 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 the theory that says the government should stay out of uh, politics and let uh, free markets uh, operate on their own uh, and have limited uh, government intrusion into that. Uh, Ward, uh, as so many of the progressives were, uh, are against that. Uh, th they think industrial capitalism and free markets have had their day and they've created a mess and that uh, free market uh, thinking uh, needs to be supplanted by more collective thinking. Thinking They weren't necessarily socialists, though some of them I think were leaning in that direction, but certainly believed in a heavily managed economy that's uh, you know, much on the other side of laissez-faire. It was Ward who masterminded the progressive uh, attack on the doctrine of survival of the fittest, with the argument that survival was always relative to the environment. So uh, yet another uh, uh, professor uh, in the social sciences here uh, saying that nature, uh, genetics, can be improved upon. Human beings aren't uh, fixed, uh, you know, in nature. Human nature isn't uh, static; uh, that it can be augmented and changed uh, uh, for the better. This is where critics sort of zero in. Uh, and say this is uh, hubris, this is overconfidence and dangerous. This is like, you know, creating uh, a Frankenstein monster, thinking you're doing uh, something noble and good, and it gets out of control uh, and it can create disaster. He talked about artificial selection to assert that humanity's superior management uh, of nature could equally be applied to human society. All true progress, he said, was artificial. So, uh, you know, natural selection, the way nature does it, that's not good enough. Human beings can use reason and science to artificially uh, select uh, and uh, improve. Conservatives then and now, uh, and who are critics of this then and now, have a principle or believe in a principle that says the stock of human reason in any one person uh, has its limits. Uh, and that human beings uh, are get easily uh, uh, overconfident uh, in their ability uh, to figure out uh, something as complex as society and economies, uh, and, you know, uh, cultures, uh, uh, so on and so forth. So that there needs to be a more uh, reserved, a more uh, circumspect, a more cautious uh, uh, hand uh, in dealing uh, with uh, social social change and trying to bring it about. Uh, this is all from Professor Leonard's book. Uh, he defended Ward, that is, race conflict as an important cause of progress in social evolution, regarding the struggles of races to be the most important subject in sociology. So it's more than a theme now uh, that progressives were hung up on race and hung up, uh, you know, caught up in racist uh, views, which again, progressives today uh, uh, tend not to hold. So, though there are similarities between progressives then and now, this is one area where, uh, it, you know, there, there's great difference between uh, the past and the present. Moving on to Edward Ross, again, uh, from the same uh, book, Social control, the way in which the aggregate reacts on the aims of the individual, warping him out of his self-regarding course and drawing his feet into the highway of common wheel, individuals are but plastic lumps of human dough to be formed on the great 
social needing board. Uh, so uh, this is uh, Ross himself, uh, right, uh, using extreme language uh, to make the point that human beings are just uh, there to be kind of changed. Uh, nature isn't good enough. Uh, uh, we're going to improve it. So I, I, I might be repeating myself endlessly, but I'm trying to really make this sort of sink into you that think about this for a second. These guys are one after another talking about how nature isn't good enough. So, and, and social scientists like us uh, can improve upon nature. Uh, na nature did a terrible job, apparently, in creating human beings, uh, but we, you know, the, the brilliant uh, few social scientists, professors, that universities uh, know better than nature, uh, know better than the universe, apparently, uh, uh, how to uh, make better functioning uh, human beings. Uh, it, it seems like incredible, and I would argue is incredible arrogance. Uh, Leonard uh, says uh, he was asserting uh, that the autonomous, self-reliant individual is now a fiction. Society now shaped and made the individual. The only question was, who shall do the shaping? Uh, so, if human beings are malleable uh, and can be improved and perfected, uh, as these guys seem to think, uh, okay, but then who gets to decide, who gets to do the work of perfecting them, and who gets to decide what perfecting them is? What type of things are an improvement uh, and what aren't is open to question. Uh, and... Uh, they're basically saying, well, we should, of course. This is where we get back to the progressives uh, sort of uh, uh, putting, at least in the minds of their critics, too much power into the hands of a few. In this case, you know, scholars who think that they know how to improve uh, human beings and human society. And if these few prefer or these uh, few uh, privileged individuals that have this kind of power, if they go awry, uh, steer humanity in the wrong direction, it can be disaster. He saw immigrants, uh, Ross that is, uh, as having, quote, and this is where it really gets ugly, uh, uh, the others at least were somewhat more selective, uh, careful about their wording, but, and I'm I'm sorry to, these are direct quotes. So these aren't my words, these are Edward Ross's uh, words. Uh, but to show you how extreme uh, some of this uh, got, Ross saw immigrants as having, quote, sugar loaf heads, moon faces, slit mouths, lantern jaws, and goose bill noses. He criticized them as, quote, cheap stucco mannequins from the south, uh, eastern, from southeastern Europe, slavs, immune from certain kinds of dirt, slime at the bottom of our foreignized cities, stupid and inert peoples, transients with their pigsty mode of life. That doesn't come across as quite scholarly, uh, right? This guy's a uh, university professor of economics and sociology at Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and uh, that's actually not just something he said in conversation, well, like drunk at dinner, that's in one of his writings. Now we get to another profession uh, that was pretty prominent in the progressive movement, uh, and that is uh, uh, um, sorry, pastors, uh, Protestant ministers, uh, and those uh, religious leaders who sort of uh, came uh, into the movement under the mantle of the social gospel. Maybe uh, the most famous, so there are a few others too, is this guy, Walter Rauschenbusch. So a Baptist pastor, theologian, uh, who did preach the social gospel. Uh, as Professor McGarr says, the social gospel pastors, like Rauschenbusch, exhorted Christians to seek salvation by reaching out to others in industrial America. Rauschenbusch himself says, the next great principle is association. Another term, kind of leading in the same direction as some of the others we saw, just different wording, different uh, labels. Now men are free, 
but it is often the freedom of grains of sand that are whirled up in a cloud and then dropped in a heap, but neither cloud nor sand heap have any coherence. New forms of association must be created. Our disorganized competitive life must pass into an organic cooperative life. We must eliminate free markets. Uh, and he looked for a more coercive replacement for individualism, that being state power. So uh, individualism and free markets uh, need to be eliminated for the benefit of society. Uh, who's uh, uh, deciding? Walter Rauschenbusch. Uh, and uh, he believes uh, state power. That uh, Rauschenbusch, this is the, the his thinking in general in a way, Rauschenbusch and those like him, experts, right, uh, uh, college-educated, oftentimes gifted individuals, whispering progressive ideas uh, into the ears of leaders who then basically just force the rest of society for their own good to try to eliminate, get rid of free market thinking, uh, get rid of individualistic thinking, and uh, support more organic cooperative thinking. So uh, you can see here that it's none too democratic in this sense, though the progressives certainly... Uh, in some ways, uh, professed and probably really believed that they were doing things democratically. They were, in some ways, more direct participation in, uh, you know, elections. But in some ways, uh, this is uh, non-democratic uh, as well. So, again, the social gospel movement, Rauschenbusch Bush himself did, uh, I think, some uh, uh, good, and they had good intentions, uh, trying to... Uh, get Americans to see that leading a, a religious uh, and moral upstanding life, trying to eliminate uh, vices and excesses of various sorts, uh, you know, uh, is something that really should be strived for. Uh, and I credit Rauschenbusch and others uh, of the social gospel ilk, other uh, ministers, theologians, uh, uh, for doing that. Uh, but again, uh, there's sort of a, a positive side and a negative side to all this. Uh, Professor Leonard, uh, again, uh, saying that evils of industrial capitalism thus were not native to Anglo-Saxon America, but were imported by immigrants from the southeast, uh, south and east of Europe, who by undercutting American wages shrank the Teutonic stock. Teutonic means kind of Germanic, like white people uh, type uh, stock of people. Capitalism drew its ever-increasing strength from the survival of the unfit immigrant. Uh, he's paraphrasing uh, Rauschenbusch himself and other uh, social gospel uh, leaders. The solutions to murderous capitalism, uh, the solution to murderous capitalism was to eliminate its sustenance, the unfit, meaning the what they consider to be you know the the the, the less able. We know enough, he claimed, to direct human evolution. Let us make history make us. So another guy saying, we can redesign human beings uh, and uh, sort of, in a way, get rid of the unfit, partial through genetic engineering and eugenics, uh, which uh, is partly what he's referring to here. Direct, uh, we can direct uh, human evolution uh, and make history make us. Uh, so uh, Rauschenbusch, as well as some of the others, who we haven't talked about in this respect, were supporters of eugenics. The idea that we can improve the racial stock of the country by manipulating, uh, right, to who uh, has children, uh, who doesn't. There were sterilization laws that went into place here and lasted for quite some time. Uh, in California, uh, had one of the most vigorous sterilization programs. Certain people that were considered unfit uh, uh, were uh, legally prohibited from having kids by being forced to have a medical procedure that made them uh, uh, infertile. Uh, and many of these uh, leaders uh, supported this. So let's look at the progressive movement in motion, the values put into action, uh, and see this kind of then from another, another angle. We've now seen, I think, thoroughly enough uh, what it looked like from the perspective, the philosophies, the thinking and values of uh, noted progressive leaders. If you noticed, uh, oddly enough, dare I say this, the professors uh, among the group we just looked at 
the social scientists, my field, are the ones that stand out uh, as I think being uh, the most objectionable, uh, the ones uh, that uh, you know could be argued to have some of the worst ideas. Uh, so Jane Addams, for instance, uh, to me she's almost a a plus across the board, uh, but uh, you know Richard uh, Ellie, not so not so much. So one uh, of the most influential aspects of progressivism uh, was muckraking journalism. Uh, the muckrakers uh, were investigative journalists overall who uh, had the job, at least the unofficial job, of investigating uh, right uh, corruption uh, and ill-doing in American society, exposing it, which was seen as crucial to uh, progressives, because remember, they believed that information leads to reform. So these guys uh, were sort of key middlemen uh, in uh, sort of taking or, or finding out what's wrong with American society and then sharing it with American citizens uh, to create pressure uh, on the system, on the society, to make those necessary reforms and changes for the better. Muckraker is the term that stuck, but it wasn't meant as a compliment. It was actually Theodore Roosevelt that called these reporters, writers, and journalists uh, the rakers of muck. Uh, and what he meant is these guys are just stirring up trouble unnecessarily, uh, you know, making things uh, more difficult for progressives like me, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, because they're, they're just too negative uh, and too critical all the time. So Roosevelt is an elected politician, uh, as was true, if I think, of all the elected politicians we've seen as progressives, had to water down their progressivism, uh, you know, to some degree, if not more, because they were elected officials. If you don't have to get elected and re-elected, you can say whatever you want, uh, you know, from a progressive perspective. If you have to worry about uh, getting elected, uh, you have to be a little more careful about what you say and what you support. So not surprisingly, uh, Roosevelt was critical of some aspects of uh, progressivism if he thought it went too far. Professor Chambers uh, says the spirit of moral indignation and the sense of idealistic purpose came in part from the muckrakers. Like later investigative journalists, these reporters exposed dishonesty, greed, corruption throughout American society and helped rouse Americans, especially middle class readers of the muckraking magazines, to action for reform. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, the idea was uh, common that uh, ideas or knowledge, information, led to reform, which I, I think was a somewhat naive idea because I think today we look at this, wait, wait, wait a minute, just because we know of some you know, evil in society doesn't mean that we're going to jump up and change it. So when we come home from work or school, we sit down at the television, on, you know, turn the television on, go through the clicker or whatever, and probably in five minutes on a daily basis, we see at least you know two, three, five things uh, that are like, oh my God, that's horrible. It's happening in the world. But we do, we, do we immediately get up and call our congressman and demand that they do something about it? Not usually. Uh, and I mean, I include myself in that. So uh, I think there is uh, a, a more naive uh, belief in the progressive era that long ago that there was kind of a more A to B uh, simple equation. Uh, again, once people get the information in their hands, they're not going to stand uh, for the shenanigans any longer, and they're going to demand change. Maybe, but I don't think it works that easily. Uh, Jacob Reese, uh, we already saw, wrote How the Other Half Lives, about uh, slums, uh, New York City. Uh, Henry Demarest Lloyd wrote Wealth Against Commonwealth, uh, which was uh, an expose of corruption uh, in local politics. Uh, Ida Tarbell uh, and Lincoln Steffens, uh, I'm sorry, Henry Demis Lloyd uh, and Ida Tarbell wrote separate uh, uh, books, both criticizing uh, Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller. Uh, Lincoln Steffens, uh, The Shame of the Cities, uh, is the one who wrote uh, uh, a scathing indictment of corruption in local politics. And Upton Sinclair, though he was a novelist by trade, not an investigative reporter, nonetheless, uh, his uh, uh, book uh, was serialized in McClure's magazine, which you see on the left, uh, as so many of these were. Uh, 
serialized, of course, means that uh, the uh, the book, the piece, was divided uh, into installments. So you read part of it in January for some clues, uh, and then wait for the next installment in February, etc. So if Sinclair's The Jungle was first published, uh, uh, you know, bit by bit, uh, month by month. It, of course, now is available uh, as a full novel. Uh, but part of this, of course, was marketing. Uh, like we see with TV shows, they leave you hanging at the end of an episode, at the end of a season especially, so that you'll tune in uh, next time, uh, right? So they want to sell magazines, so they uh, give you part of a juicy story about corruption uh, in local politics uh, and leave you, uh, right, to, wait a minute, I want to I want to know more. i got to wait till next month. So, uh, but uh, these are just uh, some of the most famous uh, of the uh, muckraking pieces. Back to Woodrow Wilson again. Uh, Wilson, uh, while he was still an academic by trade, a professor at Princeton uh, in the Gilded Age, wrote The Study of Administration, uh, which does sound rather dry, uh, and in many ways it is. Uh, but uh, it's here where he first uh, laid out the uh, uh, idea that uh, administration and government uh, was of the essence. And he wasn't wrong. Uh, I think I mentioned before that for any uh, state, any government, uh, uh, to get to be uh, uh, a, a modern success, to create, uh, uh, to be able to protect national security, to be able to uh, have a uh, uh, control, not control, uh, but to watch over a successful economy, uh, and so on and so forth, you need a professional administration. Uh, uh, you really do. But, as I said a while ago as well, that it, there might be a point, and I think there is a point, where uh, you have enough administration, and if you put more emphasis on it from that point forward, give it more power, now it's counterproductive uh, and might be uh, pushing uh, right uh, in a, uh, a harmful direction. Uh, so uh, he was right uh, to some degree here, uh, but this is the springboard, uh, sort of early thinking, uh, for his later uh, uh, belief that uh, administration, uh, right, unelected authority coming by from you know uh, their boss, the the president, uh, in you know administrative agencies, uh, is sort of really the more professional uh, and better way to go for uh, American society and Americans. And I think Wilson really believed that bureaucrats, unelected, directed by the you know, leader, the president, however unaccountable the bureaucrats, the administrators, the technocrats are, it's still better for uh, Americans. That was his belief that tended to be the progressive uh, belief. A good example of this uh, uh, came uh, during the uh, administration of Theodore Roosevelt uh, and one of his uh, closest advisors uh, and friend, uh, Gifford Pinchot, who was the head of, for a time of the U.S. Forest Service, and he's a great example of uh, a progressive uh, who uh, really did uh, administrative work and ran an administrative agency, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, in a modern, personal, efficient, professional way. So this is the idea of the administrative state at its best. Uh, Pinchot was gifted. He hired gifted people. Uh, he developed a, a, a. He helped to create an environment where there's a camaraderie, where the members, employees of the U.S. U.S. Forest Service, government employees, uh, took real pride uh, in how good they were as individuals uh, and as groups at doing their job. Uh, so maybe a certain cockiness even, but that probably spurred them to work harder. Uh, uh, to do uh, a better job, uh, you know, uh, for all of those uh, uh, issues that have to do with America's uh, forests and other ancillary uh, tasks that they were uh, required to do. Uh, so, the again, I want to stress that Wilson's idea uh, and, and other progressives' belief uh, in the need for more attention to professional, efficient uh, bureaucracy in the hands of college-educated experts, 
there's something to be said for it, to be sure. Uh, but there's another side, uh, as we know. Frederick W. Taylor, uh, one of the big names uh, of the progressive era, uh, because of his uh, pioneering of scientific management. He wrote two uh, books, Shop Management in 1903, The Principles of Scientific Management in 1911, so right in the progressive era. Uh, and he was an engineer uh, by trade, uh, and uh, he believed that, that uh, we needed to improve uh, production. Uh, mainly he was talking about factories, uh, industrial production. So uh, this is in, in some ways uh, a further development uh, from the days when the likes of Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller walked through their refineries or their steel mills looking for signs of waste. Uh, they did it kind of more by instinct, and they were good at it. But Taylor's now taking it to another level, saying, no, it's not good enough just to sort of have instincts. We need to study things, uh, to collect data, uh, time uh, various uh, you know, functions, uh, segments uh, of work processes, uh, and fine-tune them uh, and improve them and make them more efficient. So hence the phrase scientific management. Uh, you could, this isn't an actual phrase, but you could say, Rockefeller did it, you know, through kind of intuitive management. Uh, Taylor's now, uh, again, taking a further step, applying empirical data to the production process for greater economic efficiency. But uh, and this had a tremendous impact. You can, I think, hopefully, already see how progressives are going to love this. They love the idea of scientific management uh, because they're so into experts uh, and efficiency. Uh, and kind of uh, that type of heavily uh, expert managed uh, uh, type of institution. Now again, Taylor was mainly doing this uh, to improve uh, production uh, in the capitalist or industrial capitalist system, but this got applied to all kinds of institutions, uh, government, local government, administrations of all uh, different sorts in the private and public sector, did uh, were heavily influenced by Taylorism, as it's sometimes called, uh, and uh, scientific uh, scientific management techniques. But Taylor definitely had his biases against workers. Uh, he said, uh, "Hardly a competent workman can be found who does not devote a considerable amount of time to studying just how slowly he can work and still convince his employer that he's going at a good pace." Uh, when, which isn't totally untrue. Workers, uh, right? Uh, all of us have uh, probably had times or jobs uh, where we sort of slacked off and found a, a way to make it look like we were doing more than we were doing, know how to do the minimum to not get in trouble. Uh, but it does show, uh, I think, a suspicion uh, of workers and an elitism, uh, a sense of superiority over the workers. Uh, he also said in one of these books, in the past, the man has been first. In the future, the system must be first. The first object of any good system must be that of developing first-class men. Uh, here we say in yet another venue, uh, uh, a way of uh, sort of making the point uh, that the individual is not as important uh, as sort of the collective whole. Not the individual... Uh, here, it's how the system uh, works. All the people together that work in, say, a factory that uh, you know uh, are part of a system of production. Rexford Tugwell, uh, who went on to become uh, an important uh, advisor to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the next Roosevelt that we'll get to in a later unit, uh, said earlier in his career, the greatest economic event of the 19th century occurred when Frederick W. Taylor first held a stopwatch on the movements of a group of shovelers in the plant of the Midvale Steel Company, which is a pretty funny thing to uh, think of as the central economic event of an entire century. But what he's referring to is how Taylor started. Uh, he worked for that company, uh, and he just started to time uh, the, uh, how, much, uh, you know, how much time it took for workers, in this case just sh people shoveling uh, stuff, uh, to get a task done. And then, uh, right, to try to find ways to shave off the time uh, by moving workers around, moving you know equipment around, 
uh, to shave off a second here, eight seconds there, twelve seconds there, uh, on different processes uh, of the you know of the whole uh, overall pro process of production.